Well, I'm here uh, because I love the Oncology Nursing Society, and I've here, been here for two different uh, um, events. One of them was the uh, research intensive, and I was asked to chair the uh, review sections for the young investigators, and that was yesterday. And then I'm here also to receive the um, Distinguished Researcher Award. It was a workshop to um, foster um, young investigators, assistant professors and, and fellows or to um, refine their research grants and so it was a day focused on that. We brought in, there were five experts who uh, reviewed their grants and then we had a, kind of a mock study section like that they would do at NIH and they were kind of like they were watching us being in the fishbowl talking about it and then um, got their perspective on what they heard in general from all of them that was common in terms of things that they want to be, be uh, thinking about in doing their grants. And then in the afternoon they got to meet with uh, the, the two reviewers who actually were the ones that were the primary and secondary reviewer of their proposals and uh, so then we, and then we worked with them to think about the next steps and make plans to getting that grant in and successfully. <laughs> and I, I think that the learners were really um, very uh, happy with what with the feedback they got. It's kind of daunting for them when they're uh, sitting there and we're sitting around talking about their research in front of them with all these other people around, but they were very brave <laughs> about that, <laughs> so it was fun. I study resilience in adolescents and young adults with cancer and I've done that um, my whole career as a researcher. I started in my doctoral work looking at courage in chronically ill adolescents. My inspiration for that work was my daughter. I, I had always thought that I knew about preparing children for procedures and things like that. And so I thought, I thought I knew a lot about that from my training even as an undergraduate. Um, but then my daughter broke her leg and I couldn't get her. You know, I thought all this preparation, but she was just really having difficult time at each phase of taking care of this leg, getting the cast on, learning to walk with it, getting it off, and all the preparation didn't do anything. And then I just heard a, at a conference that, well, some kids seem to be braver than others. <laughs> and so that took me on this whole path to looking at courage first as, as part of a dissertation study to understand from adolescents' perspectives what their experiences of courage were. So they were kids with all kinds of different chronic illnesses. But they, they had so much to tell me and just listening to their stories of courage. So I looked at that and came up with a model of resilience from that. I, uh, and uh, so I developed the measures to measure it and then um, went on to, um, now we're doing interventions based on it, uh, so we've done several NIH studies of, to understand um, ways to foster resilience in adolescents and young adults. My latest project is to, um, is to expand that model to internationally, and I've had a lot of international students to come work with me, so now I've established the, I call it the Area Cooperative Group, the Asian Resilience Enhancement for Adolescents, Young Adults with Cancer. And so we have people in Japan, and China, and Taiwan, and Korea, and, and adding Singapore soon, and they're all re evaluating my resilience model. So let me talk a little bit about the model itself. That's really the most important. What we've learned is that, that um, in order to get through cancer experiences, we often focus on the difficult parts of it, the, the illness-related distress, I call them, the uncertainty about illness, and also the symptoms that you have. And then, but then also the ways that we cope it with it that are not really as, per, it's normal, but if you stick on doing that for a long time, then move, it's, it's really difficult to come out the other end as, as a survivor without, you know, and, and still move, and move on with life. And those are things like um, avoid and coping or really emotional coping, those kind of things. So those two factors are really important problems. But we often, in medicine talk about the problems but don't think about all the strengths and so my work has been on to identify those factors that make adolescents and young adults and I think probably most people resilient and there are six factors that I found 
And the first one is spirituality, and that spiritual perspective, that's the beliefs and practices, and that's a really um, strong driver of, of resilience, that, and, which kind of surprised me when I started you know, looking at that very quantitatively. The other th factors that influence uh, resilience are um, def uh, the, uh, what I call social integration, and that's a relationship with the hot, uh, their health care providers, but also the support of their community, their friends, and, and, and folks like that. And then the family environment is also a really important factor, and that's the family adaptability, their cohesion is, and their sense of cohesion, their sense of the strengths in their family, and their communication, especially their communication. And those things all influence the hope that they have and the meaning that they find from having their experience. And then those also, those lead to the other kind of coping, besides the defensive, is what I call courageous coping. And those are ways that people who have difficult situations deal with it positively. And one of those ways is um, kind of optimistic coping. It's thinking about the glass half full instead of half empty. But there's also confrontive coping, and that's instead of trying to run away from it or not deal with it, is to c learn about what the situation is. So in the, in the context of cancer, adolescents wanting to learn about what they can do and what's you know about their cancer and and so forth and then um, so it's optimistic and then support and coping is the third one and that one is really important in in, pe in being able to ask for help sometimes adolescents are have a really difficult time asking others for help they feel embarrassed or whatever so being willing to say you know I need some help over this or let can we talk about that or you know, those kind of things are that's, I think the other population that does a lot of that, that have difficulty asking for help are, are moms with cancer. You know, they just feel like they shouldn't have to do that. So those things are factors that influence resilience and, and then from resilience, their ability to rise above. You know, we, there's a lot of um, stories that you hear on the, on the news and things about people who are courageous or, you know, or resilient. And um, we often are in awe of them. But these factors are what help them to be that way. And my work is to try and figure out ways to help all adolescents um, with chronic illnesses be courageous or, and, and to be uh, resilient. And um, that all of us have strengths. Sometimes it takes courage to get up in the morning, right? <laughs> So it's sort of thinking about ways to help them do that. So we're at the process now of we know how to do that. Music therapy intervention was one that we did where they were able to express um, what they had to say. And we had the whole gamut of, the, of, of what they made a video about whatever they thought was important to make it about. So this was an NIH funded study, but all of the videos had all of these factors in it. We didn't tell them what to talk about or anything. And, but as we looked at their lyrics and we looked at what they were doing, we found that all of them have those things, and it's a matter of us learning ways to improve that. The other thing about that, now we're at the point where we need to start learning about that earlier. And so now we're building an app uh, where the kids complete all the measures. There's a lot of them, but they don't mind because I selected in the model through understanding, first of all, what the kids were saying. But then, um, so now, so they, so they say when they fill those measures out, and there's a lot of them, but it's, they say it's not like taking a test because we have it on an ice cream with other kids, and halfway through we have a monkey and cheering, and at the end the hallelujah chorus playing. So it's, it's, not, it's not like taking a test for them, which is great. And they, um, when they do the, when they um, do their videos, what they have to say in them is so important. And, but so we're f summarizing what they have in their in their questionnaires, and then we're putting those as an avatar on a soccer field. So we talk about all those things I just talk about their co kinds of coping and their distresses and all of those things, and we put them on a, as a, as a person on a, on a soccer field with a, a shaded area so uh, compare it so they could compare themselves to other. Uh, adolescents and young adults their same age and gender and then we can have conversations about them but the other thing that we're looking to do with that is to help them then to reflect on what their strengths are and, and then have conversations with a, a nurse intervener to 
uh, think about ways they want to work through the cancer experience and what they can draw on in terms of the strengths that they have. So we're just beginning to, you know, do that. We've done some pilot work in that and, and, and getting going for uh, additional funding for that. So it's a really exciting project where we're, you, you know, and uh, our, our feedback from our adolescents and young adults is really very enthusiastic. We're also doing the same thing with parents because we know that that family environment is so important as well. So for the for the uh, for the parents, we're also um, assessing them and, and helping them to think through and understanding a little bit more about how they want to manage and deal with the cancer. Starting a diagnosis because we if we can get them started thinking about these things early, we think we'll be, they'll be more, able to be more resilient and come out the other end of all their treatments in a yeah, more positive, positive and resilient way. So the risk and protective factors, the risk factors are those two that I talked about, the illness-related distress, and then the um, defense of coping. And within those things are the uncertainty and the, um, and the symptom distress. And those two are really big. So if they have a lot of symptoms, it's hard to overcome those. And so that's why the, it's sort of like a plus signs and the minus, you know, it's balancing those two things. When they're really sick, it's really hard to draw on these other things, but the more they can do that, the more they'll come out resilient at the end. And then the other, the, the coping one, is the differences between the defense of coping and the courageous coping is the try. When you have a, are in a difficult situation, the normal response is it's kind of that flight or, or, or fight. So the flight piece is often what that the defense of coping is where they'll not want to talk about it or they'll want to um, like just avoid it, you know, avoid talking about it or um, very, be very emotive about it. And, oh my gosh, it's so bad and what am I going to do? Or um, um, defensive, uh, <laughs> fatalistic and um, emotive. So the fatalistic, there's no point, you know, might as well quit, those kind of things. Those, those are the kinds of things. We often do, you know, when we have something really bad happen to us, you know, I can't handle it. But the, what we need to do is help them then to understand they have these other ways of overcoming these things and kind of reframing and thinking. And but that takes thinking about and, you know, kind of facing them and working through them. So by making a video, for instance, that's a way to do that and, and, and work through it. And you can see they're at all different phases of that process. Um, but it helps them to move forward, and we we did find um, positive results in terms of their outcomes, their improvement in their family communication, and their resilience, and things like that from our studies. Well, I, I think one of the things is to uh, to just look for the positive things and and to build on those because they can really the relationships that our nurses have and, and our doctors and how we talk to adolescents they're kind of hard to talk to sometimes and a lot of people don't feel comfortable but that is such an important protective factor and then fostering or helping our nurses can help the families to open the communication as well we, we did a family communication intervention where we helped the parents to um, learn how to have open-ended questioning and and, and um, distinguish between teaching and and listening, uh, and and so those so often parents are really good at teaching, you know, just don't you know, uh, but if, if we can teach them to listen more to their kids, then that that's that kind of that family environment piece to foster that, and so nurses can certainly help families to learn better ways to talk with their families if they're really struggling within their families. A lot of times there's not, um, the they're, they're, they, it's kind of a double protection thing we talk, where the kids don't want to distress the parents and the parents don't want to distress the share their distress either. And so there is this silence wall. Um, interesting, if I, if I could just talk about this, my studies in Asia, what we're finding there is there's the culturally it's very very different and families do not talk about cancer at all and so there's you have like a 21 year old who the whole family acts as they like as though it's 
something else. It's a serious illness, but it's not cancer. And so children die over there without having anybody to talk with them about it or understand what's happening with them. So that's something that um, we don't know what we're going to do with that yet because I'm working with my colleagues over there and finding that this family, there's got, there's got to be some kind of protective factors and some belief systems that influence that. One of the things we know is like the, you know, within the family, the family is is, is the value is for the group rather than the individual. And so some of that um, fosters their, la their lack of communication a bit, um, but also some of their beliefs in terms of the, you know, if you just put up with what your life is now, then it'll help, you know, the ancestors and, and kind of paying it forward or something, <laughs> or backward, I'm not sure which. We're just learning all this stuff now from the folks I'm working with over there, so. Well, you know, resilience is, is an important concept all over the world, and people, you know, look at and how, but how, and how people do that and are, gain resilience. I think these factors that I talked about are universal, but how they're enacted, and then how, like, especially within the family, if we find out this communication piece is really, really important. The spirituality in the United States was, as I said, it's one of the biggest, biggest factors and I didn't expect that when I started this you know working on it but because I did my first work in Oklahoma and I thought it was a Bible Belt thing maybe but it's not and, and it is it is the most significant like three star significance driving all of the other things in the model so um, that how that comes out and, and we've had conversations with my colleagues over there about the spirituality piece of it because that's another thing the, uh, Korea and, and, and Taiwan, there, you know, they have a lot of uh, Christian as well as, as other, you know, b but China doesn't, they don't have like religion as much. And so um, how that works, we're, you know, trying to figure out what it is. And everybody has a spirituality within them. So understanding how that works in a different country is, it's a wonderful, you know, thing to explore. <laughs>